Amen and amen. Come on, stand to your feet and welcome Sister Janice Russ as she comes to give us a message from our high this morning. Oh, I want you to bless her as she comes. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Father, allow me to witness to your grace and your mercy, to your patience. I pray that my message will be acceptable in your sight. Speak through me as you have already spoken to me. Amen. I want to give special thanks to our pastor, Reverend Williams. He was thinking like I was thinking. And he asked me to be the speaker today instead of teaching, I want to say Sunday school, but Bible discovery. Yay! <laughs> and then I was preparing my message and I kept running into doubt and kept thinking, this is not, I, this is just, this is what I'm supposed to do. Because God has called me and I am, and he's equipped me and I'm ready. And I want to recognize our First Lady Cassandra Williams and uh, the Women's Missionary Society and our President, Sister Shirley Kelly, to all who have gathered here and to my family, my children, and my grandchildren over there. I thank them for traveling. Um, last on yesterday evening late and spending the night with us um, and I thank you all for this opportunity the scripture that I'm going to speak from is Jeremiah the 29th chapter the 11th verse for I know the plans that I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not harm you plans to give you hope and a future. The moment you were born into this world, God was there as an unseen witness, smiling at your birth. He wanted you alive, and your arrival gave him great pleasure. God chose to create you. You existed for his benefit, his glory, purpose, his delight, and for his plan. We make plans every day as to what we hope to achieve or accomplish during that day. Many of us set goals with the intention of achieving them. And as we make those plans for our lives, we need to first give thought to what God has planned for us and for our lives. I've chosen for a subject today, God's plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, chapter, verses 1 through 20, the prophet Jeremiah is writing a letter of advice to the captives in Babylon. This was an open letter to the entire community, not just to its leaders. In Jeremiah's time, the letter was carried to the exiles in Babylon. Though today it's a little different we, the way we send communications. We have the various means by which to communicate. But letters were written in Jeremiah's time. The letter was carried. And the Lord spoke through that letter to, to the exiles. And they were told to be fruitful and multiply. Dipping a little into the Sunday school lesson anyway, they were in captivity. But it was all right for them to take wives, have children, 
and allowed their sons and daughters to be married. They were free to build houses, to live in them, to have gardens, and they were told not to be deceived by the prophets and the diviners that were among them, evil people whose purpose, whose plan was to deceive and to destroy. They were told not to be deceived by these, but God's people were called upon to be on alert, stay alert, because these false prophets were not sent by him. All that says that they are from the Lord are not of the Lord. You better believe that. God already knows your future. He knows the plans that he has for you. If you don't know it, you better find out. Ask the Lord. He will tell you. He will direct your path. We have some good days and we have some problems in our lives. God already knows your problems. We need to make our petitions known to him. Put them in words. Say them out loud. Speak them into existence. God, all the almighty God is as much willing that you put it into action, but you've got to speak it and want it. Put them into words to the almighty God. Do it. Don't wait. You need to hear your own voice asking, telling God, crying out to him in distress. If you're facing a difficult day, a difficult situation, something in your life that's keeping you up, why? Why do you need to say it out loud? Why do you need to speak it? Praise erases all trust in the flesh. Praise erases all trust in the flesh. Praise concentrates on God. We grew up in tough times. I have everything to be praised and thankful for. My parents taught us to have hope in the midst of where we were, in the midst of problems and situations. We were taught to pray and trust God. God hears your prayers, but you got to pray. So here in Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, we have God's people in captivity, and they will be there a while because of their sin and their pattern of following after pagan gods. In the midst of their captivity, in the midst of their doom and gloom, Jeremiah had a message from the Lord. Jeremiah had repeatedly warned the people of ju that the judgment was going to come upon them if they refused to repent. And guess what? They refused. So here we find God's people in the midst of a bad situation. Have you ever found yourself in the midst of a bad situation? Today, people are held captives of their own doing. They're depressed. Many are going through different difficult times. Some of us are feeling helpless, hopeless, lonely, and just don't know what to do. My grandmother used to pray. She prayed aloud so I could hear her and learn how to pray. And she would say, Lord, I don't know what to do but my eyes are still looking to you because I put my trust and my hope in you. 
Not my will, Lord, but thine be done. Today, we can find hope in Jeremiah's letter. God used the prophet Jeremiah to bring a message of peace, a message of hope, a message of great future to God's people. Maybe you're asking, what is God's plan for me? I'm still trying to figure it out. I do the best I can, but I just don't know where my gifts are, what my fruits, my spiritual fruits are. What do you think God has in store for you? In the midst of all that you might be going through right now, do we think about God's plan or do we just cross it out? Don't want to do that today. Nah, not me. This is not me. Not me at all. So we found ourselves in a me attitude. Some people are so selfish, they respond by saying, after it's all over and done, it's my life. It's my way. I'm going to do what's best for number one. <laughs> sure, not number one. <laughs> Jeremiah's writing to these captives in Babylon to let them know that although they were not where they would have expected to be, nor where they would have been had they asked God. God has not forgotten you, and he had not forgotten them. He wanted them to know that he still had a plan for their lives, even in captivity, even in the midst of your sin, even in the midst of your sorrow and your situation. Yes, he has a plan. Aren't you glad that regardless to where you are and where you grew up, regardless to who your parents are, despite all that you have, we've gone through in life, sickness, diseases, viruses, cancer, broken dreams, wounded hearts, God still cares for you. He still cares about us. God, because he loves us. God specializes. We used to sing that when I was in the choir back at Inglewood Baptist Church. God specializes. And he still is in the specializing business. Because he fixes things. We think we're fixing, but God is the ultimate fixer. He's not a fixer-upper. He is the ultimate fixer. God cares so much about you and me. He knows all of our sins. We think we have them hid. But God knows our sins. Only the blood of Jesus can wash them away. Only the blood. God wants to change your heart. When he changes your heart, he changes your ways. He changes your way of thinking. The hymnologist wrote, give me a clean heart so that I might serve thee. There's no other way to serve him but to give him your heart so that he can clean you up. You can't do it. Many of us have gotten forgotten where we came from. As a young child, I had no idea I was poor. And we've forgotten that. Many of us were poor. Our, or if we weren't, our parents were, our grandparents. Many of us have forgotten that lifestyles, um, are what they used to be, the old wooden houses that leaned. That was a kind of like a comedian in my, in, in, in my head. And the houses were leaning, and I wondered if the people knew the houses were leaning. And I thought, what if a wind came by and blew it down while they were in there? And then I expected that when they walked out the door, they might be leaning too. God doesn't work it like that. And I'm so glad that he forgives <laughs> even my, my foolishness in my, in my young days. Um, 
when I would think certain things like that. But Dad always told us that, you know, he always wanted us to get out of Shantytown because he had been in the military, not for a long time, but he had been in there long enough that we should have been able to get the veterans home or, or the, the no down payment. That's how we needed to get out of Shantytown. But they said, well, um, a large warehouse where they kept all the black, they didn't call it black, the colored, that's what they called it then, all the colored um, military people's records burned down. So there's no record of your service. No record that you were in the military. And they didn't just tell my dad that. They, that this is what they told all black people that were trying to get, just get out of them. But that was a way of redlining and keeping people in certain places. So we didn't get out of Shantytown, but you got to get the shanty out of you, too. And you realize that there were some people that in Shantytown that didn't live in shanties. They lived in nice homes, but they were also um, marginalized or, or placed and could not escape. So they built their nice homes next to a shanty, you know. But you got to realize that God has some great warriors. He has some great believers that even live in the shanties. It doesn't determine who you are, where you live. You better get right with God and do it now. Daddy tried to get us out, but he couldn't. But we had happiness in our shanty. It's no longer there. I still remember it. It's at 928 West Young. And I found a little picture of it, but it was not the way that I remember it. Because Daddy would always keep it painted. Um, we had chairs on the porch. We were happy. On Sunday afternoons, if it wasn't somebody's birthday, because I'm from a family of 10 children, we, it was always a birthday um, celebration. If your birthday came on Tuesday, you were still going to celebrate it on Sunday because you're going to get a cake. You're not going to get a gift. You're going to get a cake and ice cream, and everybody else is going to join in. That's the way it was. And we always went to church, whether um, it was raining or the sun was shining. If we were sick, we went to church still. <laughs> there was no escaping. Nobody got to stay home. And Dad told us that those big houses, don't be deceived, don't be fooled, because people walk out of that big house. He said, some people walk out of the big house, but there's no love in that house. So make sure there's love in your house. Make sure there's love in your heart. Don't let the outside, that's what the important part, don't let the outside of anything fool you. Many people will pick a, a pretty book because of the cover, a pretty dress. Don't be deceived. It's not in that. For every four years, or maybe five, maybe six, maybe three, Dad would take us on a family vacation. There was no vacation without all, all of us. So that took a while. You know, we packed, packed tight in the car, but we, we made it. And we went to some places like Silver Springs and got on a glass bottom boat and looked at the fish. And then uh, we did it again because we enjoyed it so much. And I think two times I remember that we went to Disney World. I don't remember Six Flags over Georgia, but mom and dad made anything that we went on as pleasurable and, it, and they told us that this didn't come. It, it came from sacrifice. It, it came from your mom and I planning on this, plans. 
We can plan, but sometimes some things came up that wiped out all the plans. Every year, as a family, we went to the Pensacola Interstate Fair. It was such an exciting time. We, we could think about it all day long in school sometimes. I daydream too. I got a slap in the back by one of my teachers for, for it. she could tell I was daydreaming. So uh, I didn't give her my ham sandwich anymore because she slapped me and I knew she meant to slap me. <laughs> and I quit that so visually I start to think about not just staring, start to think about I am here to listen and not to daydream. But th we were looking forward to the fair, and, and we all held hands tightly as we walked because we could hear the fairgrounds from our house. We could hear the people screaming. The closer we got there, we could, our excitement just, uh, my brother John let go of one of our hands when we got inside. He was so overcome with the happiness of the people and the laughter of the children, and, and he let go. And then we found ourselves, where is John? Then we thought of the stories that they told us. We now know that all of them weren't really true, but they were trying to teach us that you don't want to stray away. You don't know what, who's in your midst what their intentions are, but they would tell us things like those attractions at the fair, the fat man, um, the fat lady, the, the big snake or whatever. So then I started to pray and say, Lord, don't let my brother have to live with the fair <laughs> and grow up to be the fattest man that ever lived because he did love to eat, and he loved cakes. Homemade cakes. My mama made those kind of cakes, too. I know how to make those kind, but I try not to. I remember how sad that we were because we couldn't find John, because during our excitement and fascination, he let go or we let go. 30, 45 minutes, it may have even been an hour, we looked for John. My daddy went and reported him as lost. And we heard it on the speakers, John David Lee lost on the fairground. Polka dot shirt, brown pants, and wearing black shoes. And I remember looking around at the faces, seeing if people were, would start to look for our brother. But they didn't. And I got mad. I got mad. I said, these people aren't going to help us find John. We got to look for ourselves. My brother spotted John and we were mad again because John had a big smile on his face. <laughs> he was enjoying the fair without us. <laughs> oh boy. And on the way home, mom and dad told us that God had taken the fear out of John. Um, when we get so afraid sometimes, we do crazy things. Um, and today, sometimes we don't even realize that we are in danger because God has taken the fear sometimes for a reason. Um, but we went home happy that John, our lost brother, had been found. When Jeremiah wrote this letter, though, God's people were in captivity. They, were, they had lost their homes, their land. They had lost their independence, things that were not looking good for them. It was a bad, bad situation. Today, God's able to look beyond our circumstances and give us hope. In Jeremiah's days, these, these false prophets were ready to deceive God's people. They were saying, thus says the Lord. If we don't know the word, we'll believe. The, the Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You don't know the word. You don't know what to do. You don't know whether it's false or if it's true. So you have to study the word. The scripture reads, I just said that, 
Study the Bible. Not just read it, but study it. God will give you wisdom and knowledge, and he'll give you understanding of his word. You only need to ask for it. Sometimes I find myself reading, and then i got to go back and read it again because my mind strayed away. But you know when you've received, and then you have to pray that you receive his word, that you understand it. Some of us are caught up in the feel-good messages, never touch on sin. Some pastors preach those kind of messages every now and then, but some of them preach them all the time. Um, some pastors face criticism because I don't like him because he preaches on sin, sin, sin. But he, they better listen. Some people only attend churches where they get those kinds of messages. And when they're in those churches, they leave empty, empty. Those church members go home the same way that they came. God wants to change our ungodly ways and our ungodly plans. Even though Judah, the people of God, were chastised for their disobedience, for practicing witchcraft and following false gods, sinful lives. God has to chastise us sometimes, just as he had to chastise them. Even though we have failed God, God still loves us and he still plans and has a plan for each one of us. The God whom we serve doesn't change. The Bible says in Malachi, the third chapter, verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. God changes the plan for us. We think sometimes, this is not working out. But God knows the end. He knows the beginning. Today, God's calling us to go beyond our selfishness and our self-will and let the Lord set the course as we follow him, allowing him to work out his plans for our lives. Ask him to save you from a life of sin. You can't get it right without Jesus. You can't get it right by yourself. There is an old song that the lyric says, are you tired of chasing pretty rainbows? Are you tired of spinning round and round like a dog chases after his tail? Wrap up all the shattered dreams of your life and at the feet of Jesus, lay them down. Give them all, give them all to Jesus. Give them all to Jesus, shattered dreams, wounded hearts, and broken toys. He never said you'd only see sunshine. He never said there'd be no rain. Quit trying to make other people happy. Make Jesus happy. And you'll make yourself happy. Be happy in Jesus. Call upon him and go to him in prayer. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you no longer have that me attitude, when we want nothing but God's will for our lives, in that time we will find him. When you call upon him, he will answer. When you call upon God from the heart that is truly seeking, will all, with all your heart, you will find him. When God motivates us to a course of action, it causes us to rise to the occasion. Get to work, keep working, and never stop. If we prepare ourselves to carry out God's plans, if we seek him with our whole heart, nothing can stop those plans from being accomplished. God has given you free will 
as our Sunday school lesson says, you've got a choice. Free will. He doesn't force himself on you. You must obey his word if you want to see his plans come to fruition in your life. If you want to see your fruits grow, give it to Jesus. Give all those shattered dreams, your plans, give them to Jesus. What is God's plan for you? At 80 years old, God had a plan for Moses to lead his people. People say, won't that old person sit down? You know, that's, the, that's what they say. Or what did he let that little boy up there? Because he's, he doesn't even know what to say. Well, maybe God told him what to say. Maybe God is directing him. He's using him as he is developing. Just pray for him while he's up there. Lord, let what he thinks he's about to say be for to your glory, to your honor. Give him words to say. God has a plan for you. You might be limited in the things that you think you can do, but God can grow it. He will multiply it. Paul might have thought that he was doing good by persecuting God's people. That was Paul's plan. But God had a plan for his life. Paul, who was called Saul, didn't meet God. God met Paul. And as he was doing his own thing, his me stuff, God met him on that road and threw him down on his face. Time is winding up, church. We need to consult the Lord. He will lead you to his plan for your life. Follow God's plan for your life, not your own plan. And you got to have a relationship with God in order for God to talk to you, for you to hear him. God is saying, I'm right here. I made you. I know everything about you. Trust me. Continue to study and pray. Watch for insights from God's word, the Holy Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. His word is powerful. It brings instruction. It brings correction. It trains you and equips you thoroughly for every good work. God has a plan for you. The plan God has for you is the only way out of your problems or your situations. The future might seem bleak. It might look foggy, gloomy outside. But God has a plan, and it's a plan for a great future. God's people were in captivity, and they were to be there for 70 years. He speaks to us in our circumstances, in the things that capture us and keep us bound. When you call upon him, he comes. Maybe not when you want him to, but he's always on time. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Your hope has to be in God. Your future it is in God. Will you trust him? Will you obey him? God bless you. That's the word.